Hi, this is Paul. Over the weekend, Grail Country had a rather large Catholic panel. They, the video goes for about two and a half hours. Um, it was an interesting conversation. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be blunt. Uh, Richard Ferrier could have talked less. <laughs> Not, not that he isn't an interesting guy, but he uh, he, he tended to talk quite a bit. Um, this uh, Laura for a long time has been really wanting me to uh, pay more attention to Larry Chap. Uh, Jordan Wood, of course, uh, has been on here, and um, Nate is not Roman Catholic, but uh, brought him into the conversation. And Laura, of course, has has been on the channel and has been in the corner, and she's part of the the Chicago group. Overall, there. Are there were some really interesting nuggets that came out of this. And I want to continue talking about Vatican I. I'm not, I'm not through the Vatican I book yet. Uh, and after the Vatican I book, I'm going to read about Vatican II because there's a lot that's pretty important in this struggle. And it has to do with a lot of what we're talking about in terms of whether a country needs a religious core or civilization needs a religious core and how that religious core um, should be instantiated for it to uh, function properly. So I, I want to, I'm not going to play a lot here. There were, again, there were some really interesting nuggets here. Jordan Wood commented a little bit on my conversation with Kale Zeldin, I uh, thought we were maybe giving some excuses to Jordan. Um, and I thought, I thought, I thought, Jordan Peterson, I thought Jordan Wood's points about that with respect to, yeah, so it's late at night. Uh, character means that even if it is late at night, you should have some backbone and maybe not, uh, not misbehave on Twitter. It gets into a lot of question about um, what exactly is going on in terms of provocation versus, I would say, sort of. Uh, straight speech. But this question that Laura posed really connected with what came through today on The Rest is History on the First Abolitionists, and I want to circle that around and connect that up with the, the Vatican I conversation. So yeah, this is going to be kind of a messy video, but I want to start here. Yeah, exactly. And as someone who lived through the 60s, the, the fact of the matter is, is that there was such a groundswell of support across the ideological spectrum for civil rights. It just was in the air, as you say, and it was just considered the right thing to do. And you found both conservatives and liberals fighting for civil rights. Yeah. So Sherry asks, why didn't the church call for it earlier then? I think there are some things to say about that. Um, certainly, like I mentioned Catherine Doherty before, she did a lot of work on, on racial reconciliation and and uh, anti-racism, as I, you could say. Um, and uh, that would have been in like the 30s and 40s, yeah. 50s, right? Um, so earlier than that, she was, you know, she started kind of a movement and she was living in Harlem for a while and there were priests who were working with her. So, you know, there was stuff going on there. And then I don't know about Dorothy Day and Peter, Peter Moran, were they involved in work like that? Oh, yeah. They were very yeah. much in, in favor of uh, the civil rights and the rights of, of, of blacks and, and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so but, there were but, Catholics doing that work. But I think it, it it just happened that a time arrived when enough things converged that it was it was an opportune time to do something at a large scale. Right. And it has to be remembered. Yeah, absolutely. It has to remember too, the hierarchy was probably a little bit slow in some ways. But we have to remember the context of the times, which is Catholicism was still fighting for its place at the social and political table in many, many ways. Also, yeah, fact, that's 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 not an that is an important point, because Catholics yeah. themselves were very much still a cultural minority yeah. status at that time and often quite poor. So one of the one of the things people don't like to talk about is the fact that very, very many ethnic Catholics, be they Irish or Polish or Italian, were racist as hell. Uh, and I mean, one of the one of the staunchest places that opposed the desegregation of the schools was Boston, mm. you know, back in the 70s, as you saw this uprising of, of Irish Catholics and Protestants, you know, ag against. Now, it's, part of it was that there was also a certain contrived social engineering involved in busing st students across cities mm. and so on. But mm. there was a deep racist component to it as well. OK. And. Now, the context of this conversation is, 
is social justice or justice, how to name this, of course, coming out of Jordan Peterson's tweets. Uh, Kale had really a wonderful conversation with Karen Wong about the same subject. So we're, we're really chewing on this. And, and the point here really isn't to put Jordan Peterson on trial, that Jordan Peterson bad or Jordan Peterson good, but it gets, and this is where I say, trying to figure out the overall impact of what Jordan Peterson is doing on Twitter. He is he is provoking. Now, is that provoking bad or is that provoking good? You know, in, in a sense, you have sort of the straight, the straight model of language, which means everybody stands up and, and should say what's right or say what's wrong. Um, clearly, Peterson is sort of provoking. Now, th there's another moment, there are some other moments in this conversation which were really important. Nate Heil begins, <laughs> Nate is tricky with these things because he often begins with um, anecdotes or, you know, for example, with the, with the Jordan Wood, John Verveke conversation when, when Nate Heil brought in the transfiguration. Nate Heil brought in the fact that he was working with his mother who had a very large medical bill at a Catholic hospital. And well, what on earth do we mean by Catholic social teaching? What is that? Where does it come from? And and I almost get the, the, get the sense from people that this is from the very foundations of the earth, the Roman Catholic Church has always been the same on this social teaching. And, well, you know, we're going to continue to read through that Vatican I book. And, and, then, and then Jordan Wood, Jordan Wood's, everybody, so like I said, Richard Ferrier talked too much. Uh, I really valued all the input from the other four. Not that I didn't value what Richard Ferrier, he just... He, uh, Nate probably should have leaned in with a little heavier hand and cut him off a few times and tried to balance out the conversation. Jordan Wood was quite interesting because he would often sort of be a, a, a provocateur in this conversation because he would he would put points into the conversation that sort of sort of pushed people back in terms of now, now wait a minute what exactly are we talking about here? Oh no they. So, so those of you who are just listening to the audio podcast, this is Jordan Wood. So, what? Here's here's my here's my anecdote. Okay, uh, we uh, we went from zero to three kids, not just about Larry. We actually it was three <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Rhode Island, where I, from where you know I commuted to Boston College to, uh, and I was in the historical theology program. Okay, so don't judge me, but uh, I, I and. You know, I'm doing my best to uh, go through a program that I, that's a very good program, and I learned a lot, and I appreciate it, and I would do it over again. So, so everything else I'm going to say, have that in mind. But you know, you're not making a ton of money. It's not necessarily the lucrative thing. You definitely can't expect a job. I don't really see a lot of programs scaling back their acceptance of graduate students and the the low pay that they get, even though they're teaching classes that all students. So so you know, underneath this is well. You know, colleges, they're, they're so, aren't they sort of, this is, this is let's say, si let's say systematic, um, <laughs> how could we say this? Systematic, um, systematic inflation of incentivizing students to get degrees that will never pay for themselves. To get a to get a PhD in something about philosophy or religion or maybe history of religion or something like that today, you know, someone might argue that that's an unjust thing for these colleges to do because they're pumping out all of these PhDs and there's not going to be any place or time or or jobs for these people on the other end. But that's not the main point here. Students are paying the same amount for. Um, Right. And and I go from zero to three kids, which I think is a good Catholic thing to do, from what I heard. And and those of you who are watching, I couldn't see this because actually mostly I listened to this the first time around. Uh, Larry Chap is sitting kind of front and center here with his pipe in his mouth and he's he's grinning in his eyebrows. So he's he's very much he's very much alive inside. You can tell that just by watching his face. And so and so now here's the thing. I can't afford to have we can't afford my wife is a nurse. She she can only work part time. We don't pay for childcare. It's always one of us taking care of them all the time. 
um, I can't afford, I'm trying to do a PhD program for a job, uh, you know, in a career that probably won't have any outcome. Um, but I'm doing it cause I love it. So of course that's my choice. So that's, that's on me. But, um, the reason why we could have zero to three kids is because of state insurance, they paid for it. And, um, it wasn't my Catholic employer. It wasn't, it wasn't my wife's Catholic employer. It was the state. Um, I think that's good that we had three kids. I think it's good we didn't go into debt having a family. I think it's good that we spend time with our kids and we raise them ourselves. So um, this is the real world that we're in now. Catholic institutions in big ways have backed off. And yeah, there's a lot of factors to that, of course. There's a market, there's a corporatization of the university, right? There's the commodification of everything. There's the watering down. This, we, we could go through the whole list, right? But the but it doesn't matter when I when I'm a when I'm a father and I'm go, I'm having three kids and the state is paying for it. I'm thinking God. Hmm. Was it bureaucratic? Sure. Did I have to be on the phone two hours? Sure. That's annoying. But I didn't pay a dime until I moved here to a state where they don't have anything like that. And I'm working for a Catholic employer. I have my fourth kid and, and we paid quite a lot of money out of our pocket that we didn't have. So so my point is when I'm thinking about social justice in the Catholic world right now. It, it sounds nice to say, you know, I wish we could go back to a time when the Catholic Church wasn't racked by scandal, paying out lots of money to, to do settlements and destroy records. I wish that, too. I wish we looked back at a time whenever the Catholic Church or the state maybe could have something more like a useful, efficient relationship. Maybe that could be good. That's not this time. So what does Catholic social justice really look like here and now? And why would it be the case, for example, that opposing Rhode Island state insurance is in the interest of Catholic social justice whenever it actually allowed me to have a Catholic family? This is a powerful point. And, you know, they engaged it a little bit, but I don't think they really were able to come to terms with it, similar to how it was difficult to come to terms with the question of Nate Heil and his mother's, um, the, the way that the, the Catholic hospital threatened Nate Heil's mother that if she didn't pay for all of this cancer treatment that, you know, they would put the bill in collections and then they would have the dogs of the collection agencies come after her to, to get their money. Now, this gets into whole ranges of things where, as, you know, the story goes, the church had, had the hospitals grew out of, you know, church movements of care for the poor but of course care for the poor was or care for the poor and care for the sick was the sort of non-professional care that anyone could do bring them bring them broth or bring them you know cold compresses for their fevered heads or you know bring a bucket for their vomit or their or their diarrhea or what have you now we've got cat scans and pet scans and chemotherapy and and all of this professionalized stuff all backed by well if you do it wrong there might be there might be lawsuits with respect to malpractice etc cetera, etc cetera. we just live in an incredibly different world and and this question gets into the fact that more and more of our world is lived within this this Leviathan. So Nate and I, when we talked about uh, this question before, Nate brought up Hobbes Leviathan, which is this extended body of of human beings. But this extended body is is incredibly transhumanist now because we have all of these corporations and and organizations and economics through which there's an incredible technical level. It, it is not the case, let's say, before the Industrial Revolution, where the life was just much more lived in term, terms of a, a biological, ecological context of nature. And, and so this, this question of so Kale and Karen talked about justice versus social justice, gets into the question of just how much other, just how much of the world is human rather than pre-human. I'll say it that way. Or not pre-human, but um, human rather than our sister nature in terms of 
it, it's I don't know that I have the language to sort of articulate all of this as much as I want. Now this morning, the rest is history. Dropped their um, their latest episode, which is the first abolitionist, and it begins with a it begins with a, a content warning, which I think is is valid. I'm not going to play the part of the podcast where where Tom Holland uh, reads the kinds of the specifics of the kinds of 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 brutality that Caribbean slaves endured for the sake of harvesting sugar. But what's interesting is that here in the 18th century, now this is before Vatican I, which comes in the 19th century, but you can get a sense of the development of religion and Protestantism, especially, let's say, small p Protestantism versus big p Protestantism, let's say, uh, Protestantism, just church in the wild, which in many ways were the Quakers versus this other. And, and I think this gets into the question of Catholic social teaching because the, the history of how the Catholic Church develops what today would be Catholic social teaching is a very interesting one, given all of the layers of the history of the Catholic Church. So I'm just going to begin with Tom Holland's little content warning. Does is the horrors of slavery in the Caribbean during the 18th century. Some of the details are very graphic and maybe upsetting, particularly for younger listeners. So please do be warned. Thank you. For want of dwelling near enough to the blessed truth, I was leavened too much into the nature of the people there, which are masters and mistresses of slaves. Though I never had, nor would have, any of my own, but by conversing, trading, and living daily amongst them, where there is vast numbers, abundance coming daily to buy goods and to beg, some to steal, we had abundance stolen from us at times, the worth of 10, 15, or near 20 shillings at a time, come into the shop, whole droves together, lay the scheme, I suppose, come by appointment, when many are come in, they seem in great haste. One would say, serve me, another, serve me, serve me. Come sometimes by twilight and within night, then was their time. So when we were in a hurry, one would run away with one thing, one with another, and so on. Very much we lost, to be sure. Sometimes I could catch them, and then I would give them stripes sometimes. But I have been sorry for it many times, and it does grieve me to this day considering the extreme cruelty and misery they always live under. Oh, my heart has been pained within me many times to see and hear. And now, 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 it is so. So Tom Holland, that very moving reading is from uh, All Slave Keepers That Keep the Innocent in Bondage Apostates by Benjamin Lay, which was printed in 1737 in Philadelphia, it was printed by, I read from you in your notes, none other than Benjamin Franklin. It was. And Benjamin Lay, who is much less well-known than Benjamin Franklin, he is the subject of today's podcast, and we are celebrating him, aren't we, Tom? Uh, a man short in stature, but great in impact. And great in heart, I think. Great in, great in heart. He was the world's first, or you, you're claiming, he was the world's first abolitionist. I'm not actually... Oh, claiming that. Rowing back from the title <laughs> within three minutes of the podcast. Is... Oh, well, as regular listeners will know, you're a great one for, for the dramatic title that doesn't necessarily correspond to the theme. So Benjamin Lay, as you said, he is very, very short of stature. Um, he uh, was four feet, seven inches in height. That is short. According to one of his biographers. Um, he was also uh, a hunchback. When he grew older, he had a kind of very long white beard. So very striking appearance, kind of very unusual appearance. And as you say, isn't really a kind of great name to play with. Um, he he grew up in Essex. Um, so initially, your first attempt at reading that was in an Essex accent, but it became Australian. And so abandoned. You, you abandoned <laughs> that. Go <laughs> thinking, white stilettos, white stilettos, <laughs> and a white van, but it all, it all fell apart. <laughs> so um, he, he ended up traveling from Essex to Barbados in the, in the Caribbean, and then to, to Philadelphia and uh, Pennsylvania in the in the 18th century. So he he was born in 1681, died in 1759. And Tom, that reading. So you chose that reading. I got about halfway through it, and I thought I have no idea what's happening in this uh, 
in this reading. He's describing when he's in Barbados yeah. and he and his wife, who interestingly was also similarly um, about four foot high yeah. and also a hunchback. So a, a very, what are the chances? Yeah, very, very, I don't know whether they met on a, a dating app or I mean, who knows. They had moved to Barbados and they ran a business and starving slaves would come in and basically would shoplift. Right. And Benjamin Lay is describing how they would do this and then how in his anger he would whip them. So yeah. he says give them uh, stripes. Right, he would give them stripes and then how he became crippled with guilt by this yeah. um, and mortified by it. And he ends up deciding that slavery as an institution is wrong and arguing this very, very early on in what becomes the great kind of firestorm of abolitionism that sweeps the Anglo-American world in the 18th century, um, culminating in British abolitionism and then in the long run, the American Civil War. And okay. Now, part of what's important here and why I bring it up is you have the, the conflict between, let's say, a a system, which we're going to see in a little bit, which is the, which is sugarcane growing, and of course I bring out, pull out your bingo cards. I worked in the Dominican Republic, and the, you know, the main industry that a lot of Haitians continued to work there was sugarcane cutting and coffee picking in the area, because I was I lived in an area that also had some mountains. But so you have the this, you have early globalization, you have industrialization. You have colonization, and you have someone who, as he gets described here, has a very tender conscience. Uh, he's very sensitive to the suffering of other people. He and his wife have moved to Barbados, and they're going to try to make a living in a little store there. Um, and they, so on one hand, people are shoplifting from him, and they want, he wants to go and you know, shoplifters in America couldn't get away with this, chase somebody out of the store with a whip and beat them in the street to give them stripes, as as it used to be said, you know, quite literally. But then, you know, being tremendously remorseful and so so caught in this caught in this conflict. Uh, it's it's sort of how how can I how can I how can I process this this sort of conflict? Now, now the 443 of you who clicked on my my adult Sunday school class, this is this is deep into this question of the relationship between sin and law, because naturally the slaves who are shoplifting, you know, trying to steal food because they are starving, are lawbreakers, but they themselves are caught within a system that um, is obviously unjust. And, you know, part of what I wanted to say about Jordan Peterson and justice is that it is, it is in fact, the zeal for justice that is um, not only motivating those who would sort of decry Jordan Peterson as whatever kinds of words they want to decry him with, but, but also when Jordan Peterson talks about raising the price of energy and impoverishing, and in fact, people dying in Europe because of the price of energy in a cold winter, he would say it is unjust for these corporations to, and these governments to raise the price of energy out of a concern for the environment, let's say, whether guided or misguided. And so in, in many ways, Jordan Peterson too is raising a call for justice. But what we find so often is that we we find ourselves caught in a caught in a web between various injustices, and then the question is always, how must one act? And so, I mean, he's not the first abolitionist. So we talked about Las Casas, Bartolomé Las Casas in the 16th century, who who essentially, because he's thinking of the world in terms of human rights. Uh, and and now, if you if you really want to listen to a, a terrific. Uh, group of podcasts, uh, the rest is history, is the podcast that I listen to almost unfailingly. Um, I've, I've skipped over some episodes, but for the most part, I listen to almost everything that they put out. And their, their series on Columbus, I thought, was, was absolutely terrific. Um, this idea that every human being is, is, is created. Um... And of course, Bar Bartolome de las Casas, he also has a very interesting story and in that now he's Roman Catholic and he's feeling this. And a big part of why Tom Holland is doing this is because Tom is feeling the need in some ways to defend 
some of his thesis in in his book Dominion. I'm equally in the image of God, and therefore has God given rights, yeah. which is becomes a kind of fundamental part of Catholic doctrine. He comes to the conclusion that slavery as an institution is wrong. There are Protestants in late 17th century England who, who come to the same conclusion. But Benjamin Lay is a kind of very striking example, I think partly because, because his appearance is so striking, but also, as we will see, I, I think you might legitimately describe him as the first activist, mm. perhaps rather than the first abolitionist, yeah. because he makes... And, and that right there. He's the first activist. Well, how? Well, he is going to try to do try to do things in the light of a of its of its own social media environment because again, a little bit later they're going to talk about his relationship with Benjamin Franklin, how even though Benjamin Franklin himself owned slaves, uh, Benjamin Lay is going to somehow try to get Benjamin Franklin, who's a printer. So, so in that way, um, Benjamin Franklin has a platform, as, as it were. We don't have these vast centralized platforms like we have now with Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and, and all of these. But anybody who has a printing press in that sense has a platform and they can disseminate information. And so... Benjamin Lay is going to do all sorts of things in order to try to try to get his message out. And, and in that sense, he's an activist. The case that slavery is wrong with a series of stunts that I think will be very familiar to people from the kind of things that Extinction Rebellion is getting up to now and so on, things like that. So I think he's a really fascinating example. And he, he focuses attention on the questions that we have kind of discussed tangentially several times in the... Um, uh, over the course of the podcast, and that has often been raised in the discord, which essentially is the question of if the tradition of abolitionism is emerging from a specifically Christian context, which I, I think it absolutely is, why is it so late? Right. So why is it not until the 17th and 18th century? Okay. And and this is where we connect in with Laura's question that she raised in the, the question about Catholic social teaching. How are Christians justifying having slaves? And how is it that around the 17th and 18th century, certain Christians are coming to think that the whole institution of slavery is wrong. Okay. Well, let's, let's start with Benjamin Lay himself, Tom. So he is born in uh, 1681. And as people would have guessed if they'd only been treated to my original opening in that excellent accent, he's from Colchester. <laughs> in Essex, yeah. In Essex in the southeast of England. So tell me a bit about his background. So his parents are Quakers. Right. And he's born, as you said, in, in um, 1681. So that's absolutely within living memory, the incredible convulsions of the Civil War yeah. in England and the Republican period that had followed that, so the rule by Cromwell. And one of the things that marks Cromwell's period in power um, is a, a relative degree of tolerance towards a wide range of Christian sects. Yeah. And... You know, there are large numbers of these that, that emerge in this period, say the ranters and the fifth monarchist men and all that kind of... The Muggletonians. The Muggletonians. The sect that emerges in the 1650s that has the most enduring impact and that is still very much around today are the Quakers. Yeah. And their origins are much more kind of radical and unsettling for, for, for their contemporaries in the 1650s than they come to be. They come, to, kind of relatively speaking, to be tamed. Yeah. But in the 1650s, they're recognizably part of this sense of the world turned upside down. And their very name, Quaker, it kind of alludes to this sense that they are shaking, that they're trembling, that they're bellowing, that they're kind of frothing at the mouth, that they're crying out at their meetings. And so it's a bit like the ranters. Yeah. The ranters have gone, but the Quakers survive. And the now, now this... This extremism, let's say, th this plays very interesting along the Protestant-Catholic divide. You're going to have both Protestants and Catholics that are, what word shall we use, um, shamanistic? Is that fair? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but but this is going to this is going to you have all of this tension, let's say, between those who want to stick to the text and those who are are moving from internal lights, let's say. P again, part of the difficulty we have with all of these things is that there is, in fact, an ecology, a matrix all across the divides, like the Protestant Catholic divide. Um, there's going to be all of these tensions, all of these dualities with emerge. 
Um, this is this is fairly anarchistic in some ways that the, the Quakers are sort of a very radical fringe of you know the the late Reformation. You're talking 1650s, so this is 17th century. And and but you've had of course Anabaptists. You've you've had wildness among the Anabaptists, of course, as sort of the big P Protestants emerge. Protestants will sort of be the rationals versus, let's say, the, the Catholics who believe in miracles. You'll have those kinds of tensions emerge. And so, so there's, there's a ton going on. But one of the things that, that I also wanted to highlight is, you know, a world turned upside down, as Tom had just said here. We're, I've been preaching through Lent. I, I use the narrative lectionary that actually comes out of the Lutheran tradition. And I like the narrative lectionary because because unlike the revised common lectionary, which tends to hop around a lot, and in that way, the revised common lectionary tends to itself be the voice out of which the the church arises, or the voice of the church arises. That the narrative lectionary usually st tries to stick to um, fewer books, and so we've been in these apocalyptic parables in. For, for the sermon and this this sense of apocalypticism which is very much recurring in all of the different areas of Christianity is is very tangible with respect to the Quakers it's very tangible with respect to if you listen to the rest is history when they talk about Christopher Columbus um, I mean everybody is sort of living in an apocalyptic world as it were and um, and responding, you know, responding to it in very dramatic, personal, and powerful ways. But part of what we have is just this increase of machinery with globalization, with uh, the Colombian exchange. So you've got Egyptian mosquitoes that were carried across the Atlantic who have now come to the New World, and tertian fever. If you if you read um, 1493. Um, tertian fever or malaria has been brought over and malaria is just wiping out the tinos in the Caribbean. And so increasingly, in order to feed sugar manufacturing, the sugar demand of Europe, uh, African slaves are being brought over. Part of the reason they're bringing African slaves over is because African slaves already have multi-generational immunity to the mosquito that's brought over to America. Um, this you have the Mason Dixon line, which is is very much sort of the line at which this mosquito can live. And so you have people south. Part of the reason um, African slavery takes off in the Americas again is is the same difficulty with respect to the mosquito. Again, you can read all about this in in the book 1493. And but but you also have this sense now of all of these structures. And, and how are individuals supposed to navigate the good and the bad within these structures and come out with, with workable lines? The thing about, that's evident about the Quakers right from the beginning is that they reject kind of institutional frameworks, so priests, pastors, people who, who claim a particular authority over their flock. Yeah. Um, and so it, although it's associated with the name of George Fox, who is kind of traditionally named as the founder of the Quakers. That's not actually accurate. Basically, there are lots of... And if you want to read a very interesting book, read the read a biography of George Fox. Fascinating individual. Um, I remember reading that a number of years ago. Just very interesting time. And, and again, you, you tend to find this let's say, the, the Azusa Street Mission, the rise of Pentecostals at the beginning of the 20th century, Christianity on the frontier in the Americas, the Jesus People movement that I've made some videos about recently too. You see this strain arise, and of course, usually after a while it arises, and um, in order for a movement to sort of keep itself together, it's going to have to, in some ways, domesticate and develop structures but again once you develop those structures now you're you're starting to develop this 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 animal this is very much where we get into Ivan Illich and this Christian anarchism you're, you're going to develop this animal that can be this larger animal this larger Leviathan this larger body that can be used for for good or for ill 
lots of people who kind of emerge at similar points, similar places, and they coalesce to form a kind of recognisable group of people. So these are people who, as it were, they're, they're, the, um, they're the furthest possible extreme of the kind of the Puritan, I don't know, semi-Republican, radical, I suppose is the right word, the radical movement in the 1640s and 1650s that has flourished in the ruins of Charles I's kingdom. Yeah, so they are at the radical edge of the the radical Protestant Reformation. Yeah. And that their radicalism is expressed in various ways. So one of them, and I think in the context of our story, perhaps the most important, is the idea that there's a kind of... the spirit is within them and that this spirit is a kind of fire. So there's an early Quaker called Robert Turner and he says that the Lord moved his good spirit in me and his word came unto me, which was in me as a fire. Right. So they, the Quakers have, obviously they have scripture, they have the Bible, but what matters is not just the objective reality of what's printed on the page, but the way that you understand that with this kind of spirit within you, the, the, the fire of, of the Holy Spirit yeah. enables you to... Now, now it's, it's so amazing how, how this plays in different ways. J- just this morning, the, the Jordan Peterson excerpt from the Exodus seminar on Dennis Prager and porn and lust has sort of caught fire on Christian YouTube. And so... Uh, what do you mean? Had a video about it, and just this one, it popped up from the Council of Trent, where um, I forget this this guy's name. This is a this is a Roman Catholic apologist. Uh, he's he's got forty one minutes on this, and he's got some clips from Dennis Prager. And one one of the interesting things is he he starts going after Protestants on this. So he's going after Protestant YouTubers on major Protestant YouTubers on masturbation. And and then and then he gets on Sola Scriptura. And of course, well, you know, Catholicism, well, we have, well, we don't have, we, this isn't Catholic social teaching. This is sort of Catholic social teaching adjacent. This is Catholic, um, this is Catholic uh, sexual teaching. And it's just, I, I saw this video and I thought, wow, this is, this is so fascinating because in some ways sort of downstream of Jordan Peterson, the, the Catholics and the Protestants have in this in this current climate, um, conservative Catholics and conservative Protestants have sort of found found friends with one another. but but here on this issue, um, yeah, sola scriptura is the problem. and so but this isn't and this is where we're going to get the connection into Vatican I. This isn't because of sort of inner light inside. This is from the authority of the church that is broader than what you find in scripture. Another friend of the show this morning sent me this video, which all of these were um, candidates for for commentary, um, Awakening with JP, not Jordan Peterson. I forget his name right now, but I've watched this guy for years and he sort of began as doing sort of inside, sort of spiritual but not religious uh, yoga and all this, sort of making fun at his own people. And and now he, he almost sounds like a, a Cold War Christian conservative. He's, he's totally rethought how he thinks about Christianity and God, and now his he, he ends with the commercial of his now his most... Um, his most popular merch, which is his Got God shirt. And, you know, a good section of this was against communism. And I just thought, wow, this guy was much more sort of inner light Quakerism, spirituality. And, and now he comes on the scene sort of as a, as a social conservative enables you to penetrate to the kind of the hidden depths that otherwise would be hidden. And this is why Quakers boast that essentially, you know, Catholics, Anglicans, even Presbyterians have priests, they have elders, they have people in authority. But the Quakers don't have that. They're unmediated. Their relationship with the Bible is absolutely unmediated. Yeah. And 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 this again, this is where sort of the radical reformation isn't all the same. And this is where, of course, early Anabaptists with, um, with um, oh, what was his name? Um, 
Is it Joseph of Leiden um, and Munster? I mean, this whole catastrophe that happened at this city where the Protestants and the Catholics, I mean, everybody hates the Anabaptists. That's still in the Belgian confession of the Christian Reformed Church, even though the Christian Reformed Church is sort of footnoted and say, we no longer detest the Anabaptists. Well, because the Anabaptists sort of got their structure together and became respectable and all of this. But this is the very early days of the Quakers, and they're just, you know, they're just full of, in some ways, this... This apocalypticism, you can, again, find this in the burned-over district of upstate New York, these movements which will launch Joseph Smith and the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, um, the Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, this is, there's, there's sort of a, if you think about Christianity, let's say, as a volcano on a landscape, it's just sort of the... The, the burning edge of the lava as it flows through history, continuing to sort of incite these movements. And of course, there'll be Catholic movements, and the movement of Vatican I that, that sort of reacts to modernity is radical devotion to the Pope, radical devotion to the teaching of the Pope. And, and this comes as a reaction to all of this seething, wrestling with modernity and the enlightenment and liberalism, even though all of this is very much part of their world. A one-to-one. Yeah. It, it's one-to-one, and it's the feeling that is rising up within you that enables you to interpret it. There are other ways as well that will also be very influential on, on Benjamin Lay and his long-term campaign against slavery, which is that the Quakers are committed to a sense that all humans are, are absolutely equal, right. not just because they've been created equally in the image of God, but within the fabric of society, that no one person is better than the other. Yeah. So they have, you know, they, they reject all titles. They reject any claim that men might have to a kind of superiority over women. So kind of a very radical sense of gender equality. Um, they're very austere in their personal habits, which is a crucial part of what makes them um, influential almost immediately. People see them as kind of saintly figures. Yeah. Um, and they are very, very into expressing these views through a kind of activism. So the famous thing that they do is, is refuse to take their hats off. That is unbelievable. That's absolutely shameful behaviour. Shocking subversion of, of, of everything. That well, actually, you know what? I mean, we're joking about it, but in the, if you're in the 1650s or the 1660s, not taking... And, and, and again, so not taking your hat off. You'll read the, you'll read the New Testament and Jesus' fight over dietary rules and fasting and hand washing with Pharisees who are who are fighting a culture war with the occupying Romans. I mean, these these things manifest themselves in 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 very different ways. Taking your hat off is a big deal, Completely isn't it? It's shocking. Completely shocking. Yeah. And Alec Ryrie, who's a brilliant historian of Protestantism, wrote a wonderful book about it. He tells a story of um, a servant girl called Elizabeth Andrews, who is, you know, she works in the house of uh, Lord Newport. So he's not just, you know, he's not just her social superior. He's an aristocrat. And when she is serving guests at table, she refuses to curtsy to them. Ooh. And she, the guests are kind of more amused by this, I think, than, right. than outrage. I mean, it's so shocking that they, they yeah. can't even be it's offended by like she turned by out with it. no clothes on or something. Yeah, it's well, just... we'll come to that in a minute. But, and, and they offer her 20 pounds to curtsy. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of money. In the it is. And she, and she refuses. And she says, I durst not do it, for all honour belongeth to God. So she turns down 20 pounds. And, and so here again is a movement also, here's this other pattern that's enduring, someone who is willing to sort of break social convention and do it in an exceedingly costly way. I mean, part of the reason Jordan Peterson um, came to power was, and this is actually brought out again in the, in the video with Nate and Laura and Jordan and uh, Larry Chapp, and, and the talkative guy, uh, Edward, uh, I forget his name. Um, it, you know, Jordan took a stand and he was going to lose his career as a clinical psychologist and, as a, and as, a, as a professor at the university. And when people say, he's got skin in the game. And this, of course, is a, is a big deal in terms of Christian conversion now and why Christians who are weird, you know, in some ways they have a big social cost on one end, but they also have social clout. And and so when you look at, when you look at, oh shoot, where is it? Um, uh, must have been the previous video to this. When you look at this video. Come their soul. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of, there, there's a, there's something, it takes, well, okay. 
you know, no porn, no masturbation. This is this is this is serious Christianity. We're we're not going to do this other stuff. And well, there, you know, there it is. Refuses to curtsy. Now you mentioned the nudity. Yeah, Quakers in the in the 1650s are quite into nudity. You amaze me. <laughs> and and they're doing this not like the Adamites who are right. also part of the the swirl of the religious times who are doing it because they say you know you should try and get back to the, the primordial innocence before the fall quakers are doing this as an as a kind of activist stunt so they are saying that they're, they're doing it to highlight the way in which priests prelates presbyterians are hypocrites right. and that they are stripping off their clothes to kind of demonstrate the way in which they should be stripping off uh, the priest's clothes really and, and of course you know we we see this today um i there was just a an article. This this woman. It was it was a radical feminist woman who was upset because Amazon took the cover of her book off because she bared her breasts for the cover and and you know we should unleash women's bodies from the oppression and go. I mean, so here the Quakers are walking nude in in the area to to do this, and so you know you see these movements just go through history and and all of this going back and forth radical break anyway he goes to barbados of course he would know before he went there that there were lots of slaves in barbados wouldn't he i mean it wouldn't yes, be that's would. not a secret of course everybody means. knows that yeah so barbados in the 18th century is about as close to hell on earth as you can imagine and you know we think of it now as tropical paradise and all that kind of stuff but by the 18th century it's long since been stripped of all its native vegetation and it's been turned over to the growing of sugar yeah and the problem with this is that what you have with kind of rotting rotting sugar stalks, you have you know, great vat of water everywhere for the processing, and you have all the warm bodies of people who are, who are laboring there. Yeah. This is absolutely perfect breeding ground for the Egyptian mosquito that um, breeds yellow fever. So essentially to be on Barbados is kind of a death sentence. Yeah. And so the corollary in turn of that is that... And, and you hear about this if you read 1493, that part of the reason that they, they keep shipping, they keep trying to bring, let's say, the English over, Northern Europeans over to work in these fields in the Americas and then the Caribbean, but they just keep dying. And so they, they finally resort to Africans and they very much realize over a number of generations that their investment in bringing Africans over actually works because, of course, Africans have immunity to malaria, level of immunity to malaria, which actually causes sickle cell anemia, which if you live in the African American community, you understand that this is this is also an issue, but those things are apparently connected. And so suddenly, and then and then of course, slavery gets racialized. And now Africans are in chattel bondage in perpetuity. And so that's going to lead to to all kinds of things as well. Um, but the, the conditions in Barbados are absolutely barbaric and Tom gives another little exclaimer before he goes into just the the absolute brutal extremes that the very few white people there trying to keep a handle on just overwhelming numbers of slaves that they go to just to try to sort of keep them down. It, it's just it's some of it's it's some really disturbing stuff, which is why they they mention it. And I'm not going to play it. If you're interested, again, this is the rest is history club. I'll do the Dominic Sandbrook um, commercial and say I I have the rest is history club, so I don't have to listen to commercials. Uh, you can listen to it free with commercials, or you can get the rest is history club and listen to it without commercials, and also give support to Tom and Dominic in what I think is just an absolutely outstanding. Um, enjoyable podcast that they put out uh, twice a week. To Barbados, uh, Benjamin and Sarah Lay. And I'm assuming that like probably a lot of people in, in Britain, they knew that obviously that there were slaves in the Caribbean, but the enormity of it, yeah, the horror of it was just a blank to them. They didn't, they, you know, they, they just didn't appreciate. And they get there and then they realize in their own words, they're in a place of barbarity and ill-got wealth. So do you think that dawns on them Gradually, or do they realise basically not long after they've got off the boat? So Benjamin Lay, obviously initially, as was evidenced by the passage that you read right at the start of the show, is kind of torn between indignation that slaves are coming in and shoplifting, yeah. which is why he he uses the whip yeah. on them and then is crippled with guilt about this, but also starts to realise that they are you know that they're starving, which is why he and his wife start to give food where they can. 
And he has a very vivid description about throwing food for the slaves out into the streets. And he says, stinking as to be sure it was, yet the poor creatures would come running and tearing and rending one another to get apart in the scramble of that which I'm sure some dogs would not touch. So that obviously is is a manifest, you know, the fact that these slaves are starving yeah. is something that he's starting to become very upset by. But it's it's a few months before he sees for his own eyes the horrors that slave owners, among whom are Quakers, are perfectly capable of inflicting on their slaves. And so there's one particular day he goes to visit a fellow Quaker who, who owns a plantation outside Bridgetown, the main town in Barbados. And he and his wife, they walk up to the house and they find a naked African who is suspended outside their friend's house. And blood is dripping from, from the slave's body. Yeah. Um, and it's formed a puddle in the dust. And obviously this has drawn flies. So they're swarming around the blood and they're swarming all over the slave's wounds. And the ladies are appalled by this and confront their friend. And the friend doesn't feel he has anything to be guilty about. You know, he says the slave misbehaved. Yeah. He's my property. He has to be punished. And it's this, I think, that's, that sets Lay upon the path that leads him to think that it's not just that slaves should be well treated, which I, I'm imagining is, was his previous position, but that slavery itself is utterly wrong. And that it's this that leads him in the long run to write tracts on which he's drawing on his memories of what he saw in Barbados. So he describes slavery as being a kind of lingering martyrdom that could last you know, years and years and years. And the martyrdom, some above ground and some underground in caves and dens or mines are murdered by working hard and starving, whipping, racking, hanging, burning, scalding, roasting, and other hellish torments, very sorrowful to consider. And he says that everything that is produced by slave labor, of which sugar is the principal product, yeah. he says that it is irrevocably polluted in his words with grease, dirt, dung, and other filthiness, as it may be limbs, bowels, and excrements of the poor slaves. So there's a, that's a metaphorical, Yeah, the sugar is, you know. Now, this is where we sort of get into this question of a world of humanity, a world of Leviathan that has gotten too large. But when, let's say, if you're living a thousand years ago, and there's a tsunami, it's, it's a tsunami. This is an act of God. The, the irony is that, of course, the, um, the great um, destruction of Lisbon was a, a point in which sort of the, the question of the problem of evil begins its modern form. For, for most of humanity, it was just simply assumed that, well, well humanity... Um, you know, humanity had better be careful with the gods or with God because, you know, God expresses his wrath through these ravages. But now we have these leviathans, these, these, these creations of humanity that are fueled by, let's say, the appetite for sugar. Maybe, we, maybe today we can sort of take a whack at big sugar in a way that we couldn't uh, 40 years ago when you still had the food pyramid and, and sugar wasn't the great baddie that sugar is now. But, you know, this is, this is big sugar, and big sugar is, is doing this. You know, you cannot put sugar into your tea and not taste the blood and sweat of the slaves who, who tended to the plantations, but also literally physical. So this is something that the Marquis de Sade also picks up on in a tone very different to Benjamin Lays, it has to be said, mm -hmm. that slaves will lose their limbs. You know, the grinding of the cogs and the machinery that crushes the sugar cane. They are endlessly losing their limbs. They're endlessly falling into the... the... And again, these are human cogs. And these now are in the context of incre increasingly in, let's say, democratic nations. Whereas before, if you had sort of this hierarchy where things come down from God to the rulers, well, who are you to, to argue with, with God and God's appointed rulers? You know, even in, let's say, the Exodus seminar, um, the, Israel, you know, the Israelites, the children of Israel, don't uh, kick back against, um, this, is a, this is a showdown of the gods. This is, this is the God of Israel delivering his people from the gods of the Egyptians. It's a showdown of that. This isn't a revolutionary movement in which sh slaves break their chains and murder their slaveholders in the middle of the night. Contraptions, their, their body parts are literally part of the sugar. Yeah. And so Benjamin and Sarah Lay turn abolitionist. And I think that the reason for this is partly the industrial scale of the horror that they're witnessing. 
it's this that that makes them abolitionist because Britain is starting to industrialize. And so the ability to inflict torments on slaves is greater than it's ever been before. Yeah. It's the scale of it. It's the industrial scale of it that is the horror. They can't dismiss it as a few bad eggs. They, you know. And this will come up again in, in Nazi Germany. It's not like the Germans developed genocide in the Holocaust. Genocide has been practiced by human beings against other uh, human beings from time immemorial. In fact, in, in the Bible, you'll have commands of God to commit genocide against, against certain tribes. Of course, um, um, Jericho has to be wiped out. The... Um, the, the sin of the Amorites. I mean, just on and on and on. This is, this is what happens. So when we get to this conversation about Catholic social teaching, well, this is sort of like the, the, the case that, that Jordan Wood points out in, in, the, in the, the Rhode Island, you know, by the state, the medical center, and, and Nate points out with the Catholic hospital, well, well, the world has changed, and, and how are we to think about this? Now, this this really is a ter terrific book, and I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. Thinking about, you know, when I had my conversation with Nate, you know, he kept, the whole liberalism, liberalism, well, Jordan Peterson is, is in some ways, and Tim Keller, uh, and the Protestants, you know, we're, we're just sort of, you know, liberals, liberals at work here. Now, if you go back to the rest is history's episode on Geneva and Servetus. And one of the things that Tom Holland, Holland points out there is, is part of what happens in Protestant states, cities like Geneva, is that, well, it's the city that is responsible to do this work of what today would be probably the inheritance of Rhode Island paying for Jordan Wood's three children. And, and what you see in this story of trying to figure out how the Catholic Church comes to terms with these titanic struggles and changes that are going on through Europe. Now, now the, less the rest of the world sort of feels smug about this, anytime ever anyone brings up, let's say, the, the rise of insurgent Islamism in the Middle East, people will then sort of jump in to say, well, that's because they haven't had a reformation. Well, this is all part of the part of the very bloody struggle of, of Reformation. Now, and, and in, in fact, of reform. So we talk about Catholic social teaching, you have this question of reform. And, you know, uh, some, some of you in the comment section have been very helpful because Vatican II radically in some... How, how to talk... I don't know how you Catholics talk about this, quite frankly. Because you read things like all of this stuff is supposed to give you a sense of one answer through time. And it's like, from Protestant eyes, it sure seems like y'all are wrestling with a bunch of stuff and changing your mind and changing your, altering your doctrine. And, and it seems like every time you sort of try to nail things into the ground, like with papal infallibility, you wind up with all kinds of other struggles. Somebody, somebody had a comment that, that I'm, I'm anti-Catholic. I, I don't feel myself to be anti-Catholic. Um, I I'm just trying to understand this really amazing history, and it's I, I'm just you know Kale and I are sort of enjoying this conversation because it is amazing history um, how this stuff how this stuff works. Chapter one in this book, Catholicism and the, and the Century of Lights. In Catholic areas of Europe in 1869. Now remember, this is well now after the French Revolution. So you, what you have are these are these wild surges back and forth. And again, this is now this is now you know a century and a half after Benjamin Lay, and this is in Europe, not in the Americas. Benjamin Lay leaves again. Listen to the whole rest of history podcast on it. It's, it's it's a fascinating podcast. In Catholic areas of Europe in 1869, on the eve of the council, the churches were full. Men, women, and children participated with obvious sincerity in a, variety, in a rich variety of religious devotions, including public processions and pilgrimages to local shrines. So it's, it's fascinating to read something like this because, again, I think generally speaking, via the subtraction story, as Charles Taylor 
talk calls it, we have this very low resolution picture that religion is just always receding. I mean, if you listen to Sam Harris and a bunch of the new atheists, that's usually sort of the image they get. But if you actually read history, you say, that isn't at all the case. This is this is a country that just, you know, 70 years before had, had been basically wiping out the church. And now by 1869, in Catholic areas of Europe, they're having a renaissance. Churches are filled. Public processions, you know, pilgrimages. This is very Jonathan Pajot-ish. Um, lots of symbolism going on. New religious orders of women had sprung up. And vocations, because women, they're just always oppressed. You know, th these, these low-resolution pictures of history of oppression that are slung by new atheists or, or you know, liberationists of one sort or another. Um, new religious orders of women had sprung up. Vocations to the priesthood were plentiful. Nuns and priests were leaving Europe in large numbers to spend their lives on foreign missions, usually with little prospect of ever returning home. Such phenomena was not deceptive. Almost, where, almost wherever the Catholic Church found itself, it showed remarkable vigor. By 1870, the church numbers perhaps as many as 200 million members, of whom three-quarters lived in Europe. Membership was especially concentrated in four areas, France, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal. About 37.5 million Catholics and a total population of 38 million. <laughs> the Protestants, the Huguenots, sorry, <laughs> go to the other places in Europe. You get to go to the Netherlands or Switzerland or Hungary or, or England or over to the Americas. Not many Catholics in America at this point, although more are coming in the latter part of the 19th century. France was the strongest Catholic nation. By mid-century, it sent two-thirds of all missionaries leaving from Europe. Two decades later, it numbered one nun for every 350 inhabitants of the country. Plenty of nuns for hospitals and schools. Although sharply divided ideologically, France led the church with new Catholic initiatives, which flowed from there to the rest of the church. But Spain, Italy, and the traditional Catholic areas of German-speaking lands Let's talk about German Catholic synods now. Um, the population sold themselves similarly devoted to their Catholic heritage and ready to meet the challenges of the day. This is a remarkable thing because the chapter is then going to shift to a lot of the turbulent history before where you have things like Napoleon wiping out the papal states and grabbing the Pope and putting him in jail. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy history, much of which I had absolutely no idea about. This vigor is all the more remarkable when viewed against the background of 50 years earlier. The French Revolution and its pan-European Napoleonic aftermath had traumatized the Catholic Church. As the revolution became even more radical, it turned anti-Catholic. Voltaire's wish, um, let us destroy the villainous thing, became the rallying cry. You know, you have this, this movement to destroy the church. Before this turn of events, large segments of clergy supported the revolution and its goals, but the situation soon soured. The revolution hardly begun uh, when the government, on the verge of bankruptcy, seized all the property of the French church, an act that, with one blow, reduced the richest church in Christendom to almost destitution. At the revolution's most radical stage, the reign of terror, the government sent priests, nuns, and bishops to the guillotine and drove others into exile. Angry mobs sacked and destroyed churches and monasteries. The revolution was far from being an exclusively French affair, although nowhere did it devolve into the forms as radical as those in France. Every country in Western Europe felt its impact, and the church suffered accordingly. Across Europe, the onslaught devastated the great religious orders, such as the Dominicans and the Franciscans. In other words, this new flourishing of religious orders in, the 18, in 1870 comes after the destruction of religious orders at the beginning of that century, and not by Protestants. The execution of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette threatened all monarchies and by extension the church, which for centuries had supported the monarchies and in turn had been supported by them. The executions put fear into the hearts of kings, not the least of which Pius VI, the Pope of the era, a monarch by virtue of his office as the ruler of papal states. And, and again, I think for most people today, you'd say, yeah, don't forget the Roman Catholic, the Pope ruled, didn't just this tiny little enclave called Vatican City 
I mean, in, in some ways, the Pope is reduced to house arrest, even though he can travel, of course. But compared to what he used to rule, you know, until sort of the coalition of, of the nation of Italy. And, and one of the big stories of this is, is the relationship between nationalism and religion. Despite all, the church survived and emerged from the trauma seemingly stronger and more vibrant than before it, faced, however, new and extraordinarily difficult challenges, many of which were due to the ongoing effects of the revolution and to the philosophies that undergirded it. The challenges included the dramatic social changes resulting from the Industrial Revolution and from the new means of transportation and communication, such as railroad and telegraph. They included the intellectual changes emerging from the new critical approaches to the past, which did not spare sacred texts and sacred traditions. The Enlightenment had, moreover, turned Europe's face away from the past with its superstition and obscurantism towards an ever brighter future. In this scheme of history's course, modernity was not simply a designation of the present state of affairs, but an ideology. According to this ideology, the present is better than the past. Does this sound familiar? And the sooner is, uh, and the sooner the past is forgotten, the better for all. And we've forgotten a lot. Heavy ideological baggage now weighed down the word modern. Tradition, once a norm in belief and source of culture and enrichment, had shifted into an obstacle blocking the path, the march of progress. Both For both friends and foe, the Catholic Church stood for tradition in its most unqualified form. Although, to some degree, challenges like those affected everybody in the Church, they most directly troubled the Church's leaders, the popes and the bishops, for good reason. Many of those leaders looked looked with dismay upon what was taking place before their eyes and interpreted as the destruction of fundamental Christian values. They therefore set the church in opposition to the modern world and felt obliged to take on the role of chief defender of the church and civilization under siege. What, what you begin to find, however, is that modernity keeps winning. And so, you know, some of the, the current fight going on over Vatican II has a lot to do with this because a big part of the rise of papal supremacy and infallibility has everything to do with they're just the cat the church is just seeing itself lose on front after front after front and kind of the only way to marshal this is to get a strong leader and, and of course, this is something that you see in terms of nations. Look at Oliver Cromwell and the strong leader to displace the monarchs who were strong leaders. So, so the story will talk about Gallicanism. And what, what you see are th this struggle sort of takes on the shape of, let's say, the authority of local bishops versus the authority of the centralized church. And again, you can see this if you want to Look at what's going on in Germany right now over same-sex marriage and a whole variety of things. Just type in German Synod in the news thing of Google and you'll get you'll get links of all sorts of stuff going on now. And and in some ways, this expectation that Pope Francis should squash this. Well, these are the same tensions that were bearing out in the 19th century as in some ways, you know, between local authority or even nation national churches versus this versus the supremacy and the infallibility of the Pope, and whether this book talks about it a fair amount, whether the Pope is faithful to the degree that the Pope expresses the tradition of the church, or whether the Pope is in fact emulating the teaching, you know, giving the church teaching direct from God. And you see this as a big part of that struggle. Now, again, in contrast to the Quakers, for whom it's coming inside from your hearts. And, and you can see that sort of played out in this, this Christian context of spiritual but not religious that, um, that JP is sort of pushing against versus you know, comes down via an authority, like all of these dualisms. Important though Gallicanism, Jansenism, and newly aggressive nationalism are for understanding the position of the church in the second half of the 18th century, perhaps even more important is the impact of the Enlightenment. 
complex and multi-form enlightenment was, was differently appropriated by different groups and counted within its ranks many bishops and priests as well as those who despise such men. Despite its complexity, the Enlightenment was, fairly, was a fairly coherent intellectual movement in its basic assumptions and goals. For many Enlightenment philosophers, few goals were more primary than the pursuit of political liberty, equality, and fraternity, goals that took on particular resonance in influential circles in France. Those goals, and, and this is where sort of the conservative politics get very interesting because you'll have some sides in America that are deeply enlightenment values. We're talking liberty. Liberty must be foremost. And, well, no, um, authority of the church should be foremost. Now, wait a minute. And you can see these tensions even in someone like Doug Wilson, which is tremendously fascinating to watch. Those goals were not necessarily incompatible with the political status quo or with the Catholic culture of the times, and hence they were easily embraced by a large segment of the elite. But in an extremely difficult economic situation in France in the second half of the 18th century, they began to take on ominous implications. So what is Catholic social teaching when, um, by virtue of what's happening in France and the hunger that begins to stalk, in some ways, the richest country in Europe, um, where's social teaching then? Because what, what rises up is, you know, obviously the hunger brought this wave in the French Revolution of fervent anti-Catholicism. Many in the political and religious establishment began to fear that if implemented, they would overturn the right order of society. When the revolution broke out and became even more violent, they saw with dismay how correct their assessment had been. Now remember, I started talking about the church flourishing in the 1870s, and now we're in the middle and towards the end of the 18th century, the 1700s, and France is coming apart. Integral to the pursuit of liberty were freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Who today right now, even in sort of conservative movements, would say, well, that's kind of the discussion that we're having. We have too much freedom of the press. Oh, really? The first two freedoms ultimately meant the end, or at least a significant reduction of censorship by church and state. Because remember, the church censored a ton. Freedom of religion meant the end of the confessional state, that had, be, that had come into being with the Peace of Augsburg. This is sort of how the Protestant Catholic prince situation was sort of resolved, which famously decreed that each ruler had the right to determine the form of Christianity would take in their realm and insist on its subjects conforming to it. Undergirding these freedoms was the assumption that legitimate authority did not descend from on high, but rested from the free assent of the governed. So it was very interesting when, when Doug Wilson was on John Anderson to hear this is the teaser clip that gets brought out from the, from, the, from the conversation. Every society has a god of the system. Right. So uh, I want to argue that the god of the system needs to be the true god, the god that parliaments and congresses can't reach. Because otherwise, if your highest moral ethical authority is under the sun, inside the world, then you, the god of the system is Demos, the people. If Demos is the god of the system, then you have to be prepared for an ethical system that changes radically and arbitrarily. So, where is he? Is, is, would he be lining up with ultramontanism? Now, now, he'd say he wouldn't. Now, ultramontanism, this is you know papal supremacy. He'd say, no, the Bible. But now we're sort of back into the the realm and the fight of the Protestant Reformation. Now, it's very interesting because even often in this little corner, Protestants sort of get tagged with, well, enlightenment comes from Protestants. And yeah, fair enough, it sure does. And all of these democratic values that, that you know, were in many ways pioneered in America and its success in America flowed to other nations. Well, you could argue that it came actually much earlier in England, and that's where we got it in America. And, and actually, within the church, you've always had this tension. You have the Council of Jerusalem, which is not, you know, James the Just sort of says what the group is going to say, or Peter. And, you know, so you've always got this tension in the church between the group and the leader. 
Historians long forgot that the values and perspectives we associate with the Enlightenment developed in France, Italy, Austria, and similar countries within fundamentally Christian, a Catholic milieus simply as part of the cultural air people breathed. The values and perspectives, which were not always coherent among themselves, were not the abstraction we call the Enlightenment, but questions and issues discussed and debated in elite circles as they rose to prominence. They developed, moreover, a gra at a gradual pace and in a piecemeal fashion over the course of decades and were in gradual piecemeal way appropriated and not um, appropriated or not appropriated by believers who were still the vast majority in those countries. Partly for that reason, the incompatibility of Catholicism with at least some elements of the Enlightenment did not become an acute issue until the middle of the 18th century. Pope Benedict XIV, 1740 to 1758, not only showed no animosity towards the Enlightenment, but behaved in ways that demonstrated its, its profound influence upon him. For example, he successfully supported the removal of Galileo's writings from the index of prohibited books. And in 1741, just after his election, he seemingly without scruples accepted Voltaire's dedication to him of his play, Muhammad. Although towards the end of his pontificate, his attitude hardened, he remained an outstanding model of an enlightened bishop. Historians have therefore challenged the once canonical view that the 18th century was essentially an age of religious skepticism and declining belief. They speak of a Catholic Enlightenment, by which they mean the selective appropriation by bishops and, other va um, and others of values and perspectives we associate with the Enlightenment. We have uncovered and described a religious anthropology that tempered obedience with rationality, affirmed the possibility of substantial human progress in arts, sciences, and morality, despite the fall of human nature, and, offer, and often favored more conciliarist collegial styles of government. The Peace of Westphalia, 1648, ending, ending the Thirty Years' War, had been a great turning point. It marked the end of the religious militancy of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. Catholic rulers and churchmen alike wanted to put dogmatism, fanaticism, and religious wars behind them. They searched for arguments in their cultural heritage to boost that desire, and they thus helped set the stage for the rise of the Enlightenment. They were partly inspired by the reforms of the Council of Trent, especially its emphasis on the authority of bishops, as well as by contemporary Protestant thinkers just as, such as John Locke, who basically Thomas Jefferson would take his notes, write them in the Declaration of Independence, and Isaac Newton. Theologians and religious thinkers set out to defend essential Christian doctrines by explaining them in more modern and more rational terms. They wanted to appropriate for Catholicism new theories in economic, science, and judicial thought. Some bishops and rulers applied um, that they learned directly to what they learned directly to church affairs. Such application meant, generally speaking, implementing measures to streamline clumsy and ineffective procedures simplifying, simplify overlapping and conflicting areas of jurisdiction and eliminate or drastically restructure institutions that seem to have lost their usefulness. These reformers aimed at creating a neater, more modern, more pastorally, more effective church. Although Emperor Joseph II and Grand Duke Leopold of Tuscany must have numbered among such reformers, others were less radical and their efforts more broadly acceptable. To give you a sense just at what level this fight between nations and the Catholic Church was, in 1804, Napoleon invited Pius VII to Paris for his coronation as emperor. At the ceremony, Pius anointed Napoleon and the Empress Josephine, but in defiance of tradition and an affront to the Pope, Napoleon very famously placed the, um, placed the crown on his head himself. Despite Napoleon's attempt to put the Pope in his place, Pius emerged the victor. His long journey from Rome to Paris turned, without any planning or orchestration, into a triumphant procession. As with Pius VI on his way to Vienna a generation earlier, enthusiastic crowds greeted the Pope all along the way. I'd call that celebrity. A sign that despite all that had happened, Catholicism at the grassroots remained strong, recognized the Pope's special place in the church, and held him in reverence. 
Napoleon, however, took his revenge. The next year, he declared himself king of Italy and set about making his kingship a reality. His relationship with Pius badly degenerated, and he boasted he would strip that foreign prince of all of his pretension. On February 2, 1808, French troops again occupied Rome and put Pius under virtual house arrest in the Quirinial Palace. France then annexed the rest of the Papal States. The next year, Pius, his patience at an end, excommunicated all robbers um, of the patrimony of Peter. In the confusion that followed, the French seized him, removed him from Rome. Napoleon sanctioned the deed and, as a consequence, held the Pope prisoner in France for the next five years until his own defeat in 1814. Can you imagine something like that happening today? Why not? So many levels, why not? Can you imagine, let's say, the head of the Italian government pulling the Pope out of Vatican City and putting him in an Italian prison? It's unthinkable. Why would he? Once Napoleon was removed from the scene, the victors met at the, Con at the Congress of Vienna under the leadership of Count Clemens von Metternich to reverse the direction upon which the revolution had set society. The Congress did all in its power to reinstate the right order of things that had prevailed before the cataclysmic event. It restored monarchs, including the papal monarch, to their thrones. But as events soon showed, the clock refused to be turned back. Monarchs were soon chased from their thrones, only to be reinstated some years later, then to be chased away uh, once again. The political instability did not, in the, in the least, spare the papacy. You can see why George Washington said, don't get involved in European wars. This is the stuff they're fighting about. And you can see why America's like, no state church here. If Massachusetts wants to have one, fair enough, but none over the United States. Nonetheless, for the remaining years of his reign, Pius VII won respect by his judicious domestic and foreign policies and was able to steer a steady course in a stormy sea. He restored the Society of Jesus worldwide, reversing the ordered suspension enacted by Clement XIV. He worked well with his astute and forward-looking Secretary of State, um, Ercole Sal um, um, Consalvi. Though cons uh, through Consalvi, Pius was able to negotiate a number of concordats uh, with both Catholic and Protestant states that at least for a time being served the church well. In all of these, as with the French Concordat, the state retained or gained some say in the nomination of bishops. So there's an old Protestant issue back and forth. In a broader, on a broader scale, Pius won respect as a person who successfully negotiated with Napoleon. He earned even more respect because he, more than anyone else in Europe, had resisted the despot and refused to be cowed by him. He had risked all, including possibly his life, to save the integrity of the church and its authority. But, well, things would again get turned the other way. Pius's successor, Leo XII, 1823 to 1829, after a storming beginning, eventually continued Pius's policy of con um, conciliation with other states. He policed his policies within the Papal States, however, reversed many of the reforms Pius and Consalvi had initiated in trying to modernize the situation, um, modernize a situation dreadfully in need of it. By his action, Leo unfortunately consolidated world opinion about the political backwardness of the Papal States and ineptitude of Papal rule over them. Leo's repressive measures resulted in a police state with spies and informers abounding and severe penalties imposed for even the slightest hint of incitement to civil unrest. He once again confined the Jews to the ghetto and had the gates fitted with locks. Such measures alienated his subjects, and you can see where the Enlightenment views are already permeating, and they're permeating even in within the Papal States. Now, things would get so bad that you'd need foreign intervention that would, have, that would come into the Papal States, and, yeah, it, it's, it's all an incredible history. Now, when you get into the next chapter, what will develop is that, well, here's the thing. Above all, they um, for them, the Holy See was the center where everything came together, not the source from which everything flowed. And you'd see that turn around. And ultramontanism became this way by which, well, maybe now we can strengthen the church and have it stand up against all of these other forces. 
So when I hear something like Jordan Woods talking about, well, okay, we've got this subsidiary ideas and nested authorities and volunteerism and all of that, but does the state of Rhode Island sort of outdo the church and able being able to provide some of the ends that Catholic teaching wants, such as the flourishing of my family and the enabling of myself and my wife to have many children. You can see why this is a difficult conversation. What exactly do we mean by social justice? How Catholic is this? When you read the history, it's flailing back and forth. Is the Catholic sort of the seedbed of, of enlightenment thought that sort of springs up and the Protestants are sort of these, these radicals over on the fringe who are able to take on slavery and, and take it down as an institution, especially, let's say, in a democratic way? Um, Andrew or, or Benjamin Lee will go on to, you know, live in, in a in a cave with a goat with his books and and but he eventually wins and, and eventually the Quakers themselves divest themselves of slavery and become sort of this vanguard of abolitionists in the UK and America that are that are sort of leading the charge against the this Leviathan evil institution of slavery that has a that has sort of grown under the appetites of big sugar. I told you it was going to be a messy video and I think it's over now. I'll be really interested to hear your comments.